There it is. Sorry about that. I had this video almost completely done, and the phone rang, and I, instead of pressing pause, press stop, so I'm starting completely over. Please take out your uh, double column notes from class today. Here's the goal today, or tonight. I'm going to try and complete number three, okay? Number three, the resources and uh, relative strengths during the Civil War, and then tomorrow we'll get into a reading in class and hopefully have an activity to get us through number four uh yeah number four and then that'll take us through this double column notes and we'll be we'll be in good position to be uh through the civil war um, by the end of the week but uh, uh, let, here's what we're going to pick up um both classes third and fourth you both got through population in third period we had been talking about clothes and shoes and we were going to move into infrastructure tonight um a fourth period did not get into clothes and shoes, so I'm going to recover that. So you both have, um, both classes have the population information in your notes. And third period, you should have clothes and shoes, but but you might want to pay attention because I am going to add wool. I found the wool in my notes. Um, so, you know, the importance of clothes and shoes. I think I think it's obvious, but just to to make sure that we're, we're on the same page with that, You've got to you've got to outfit your soldiers. You've got to give them you know shirts and, and coats and pants and boots and socks and things like that. And in order to get them to you know march 20 miles to go meet an opposing army in a day, you you know you need to be well outfitted. And so the statistics I'm going to share with you now, what I want you to be thinking about are: Do these statistics give one side an advantage over the other? And that's what you should be keeping track of in your notes. Not only the numbers, but what do these numbers tell you? What are you learning from these numbers? So let's start with shoes. And I know third period, you already have these in your notes. But I'm going to give you a number. So let's say the Confederate, not say, the Confederate States of America, right, the South, had 1,635 establishments that made boots and shoes. 1635 in the South. And that number's not all that telling, right? That could be a lot. It could be a little. What we need is a point of reference to compare it to in, the, in, their, in their competitors in the North. And so let me give you another number, 2,127. And what I'd like you to ask yourself is, would 2,127 versus 1,635 give the North a pretty significant advantage? You know, just think, you know, does that give them that many more boots and shoes? What I need to add to that, though, is that that 2,127, 2,127, that's only in New York. It's not the whole North. And so you have to project that out. There are other shoe establishments throughout the North, Maine, Massachusetts, uh, Pennsylvania, across into Ohio, Michigan. There are, there are other manufacturers of shoes. And so, you know, by starting with just a state, my point is to emphasize, you know, how dramatic of a difference this is. And I can do this again with cotton. You know, think of socks and, or wool, wool probably with socks, but think of shirts, other things that you'd use cotton for. You might make an assumption that the South would have an advantage in cotton because that's what they do, but we're not just talking about the cultivating of cotton. We're talking about the spinning of cotton, turning the cotton into a product, linen, something like that. In 1860 census, what we know is that throughout the South, the entire Confederacy, there were manufacturers spinning, creating with cotton up to $8 million worth of products. So $8 million in value of cotton products were being manufactured in the South. I'm going to give you a new, another number here, and that number is 13 million. And just like I did with shoes, that's not the whole North. That's just Pennsylvania. And so you can start to see the discrepancy between the whole South and just individual states. And I did that with population also. Um, the last one in, in third period, you don't have this one, but it's wool. And wool is important because that's the coats and the, and the pants that the soldiers are going to be wearing, in some cases maybe the socks. Um, the wool output in the Confederacy, the whole Confederacy is $1.9 million. So they are generating $1.9 million worth of woolen goods annually. And the other number I'm going to give you is $19 million. And that's just Massachusetts. And so I'd like you to take a minute here, you know, you can press pause or you can do this after the fact, but I'd like you to, for, for B, you know, what does this tell us? What is the relative strength? What kind of advantage is this? How does this help or hinder the North versus the South in the Civil War. But let's move on to C. And I'm going to blow up this picture a little bit here. I might even be able to zoom in. We'll see. But I'm going to blow this up for sure. Um, you know, this is this is railroads. 
in rail railroads in the United States in 1861. And what C is talking about is infrastructure. And when we look at infrastructure, the key piece of infrastructure in this time period is the, the new railroad. Um, and this, this new railroad, um, it's relatively new, but these new railroads are being built at a pretty quick pace in the north, as you can see. You know, the number that I would give you is that for every one mile of railroad that you have in the Confederacy, you have two and a half miles of railroad in the Union. So that's, that's the advantage, right? That's the number, two and a half to one. But that's not where it stops. There's two other things that I would note here. Um, you know, you've got to manufacture locomotives, the, you know, the, the train that drives the train. And in the Confederacy in 1860, there were 19 locomotives manufactured. In the North in 1860, there were 470 locomotives manufactured. And then if you even go further, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to zoom in on this a little bit, but look at these, these, these little railroads here that don't connect. And even some of the ones that do connect, if they cross state lines, what we, what we know about the history of the South and the way they developed their railroad is they did it very interstate, I'm sorry, intrastate, not interstate. And so what that means is they built them in Alabama and they did decided, you know, in Alabama, our tracks are gonna be this wide. And then when they get to Georgia, we got to hope that they're this wide in Georgia, whereas in the north, they agreed to a standard gauge. So all the railroads measured up, and we could talk a little bit tomorrow about what, what's important about that. But that's a significant infrastructure piece. Another piece of um, infrastructure that we would, you know what, that, that's good for infrastructure. Let's move on to, let's move on to the, um, to food. Because food is, um, you know, food is significant. So if we go back to this map, I'm just going to zoom in on this one, even though we use this for military military operations, it'll still serve its purpose for food. Um, you know, we have in the Union, we see you know, this, this belt, right? And Missouri is significant because Missouri stays loyal to the Union, but there's food production there. Kentucky, there's food production. And this belt of Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, even into uh, Western Pennsylvania, up into Southern Michigan. You know, this is, a, and I guess you could even say into Western New York, there's a significant belt of food production. The, um, the Confederacy has the potential for great food production in that they have great farming land, but it's during the Civil War that we see that many of these large plantation owners are unwilling to make a transition from um, producing or from growing cotton to food production. And so the bread, bas bread basket of the Confederacy is going to be right here in Tennessee, the central corridor of Tennessee. Tennessee is going to Tennessee is going to be essentially responsible for feeding the entire Confederate Army. Now, I'm going to, you know, just to preview something that we're going to talk about, in, you'll read about and talk about in class tomorrow, but it's significant for this food production, and I would want you to have it in your notes here, is that this war starts in 1861. Tennessee, the bread, the bread basket of the Confederacy, is going to come under Union control in 1862. So within a year, they lose access to that production. The last piece is military goods, and, and we'll get into leadership a little bit more tomorrow, but military goods. And so if we, if we just talk about a couple of pieces of, of um, military goods, um, the things that I would focus on, you know, like horses and mules, these are important to war efforts, you know, especially in this time period. You know, they are pulling the, the wagons, they carry cannons, they carry artillery, you know, supply wagons, all of these are, are, are pulled by what we call beasts of burden, right? Horses and mules. And Missouri and Kentucky are leading the way in the United States. I'll go back to this map. So we got Missouri and Kentucky. Think about the importance of border states. They're followed by Tennessee and Virginia. Um, if we look at <clears throat> the ability to manufacture um, weapons, the amount of manufacturing that can make the transition to um, weapon production in the north far outweighs the south. The Union has money to pour into this. Um, if we look at, for example, um, you know, ironworks, if we, if we look at Ohio and New Jersey, you know, they, they were producing more than half the nation's iron. And all of these, um, you know, all of these statistics are, are, are leading to a, a, an economic advantage, an on-paper advantage. And what I want to make the transition to tomorrow, and I don't want to do the whole thing today because the video will be too long and it's, and it's not worth doing right now, 
But what I want you to think about coming into class tomorrow, and I'm going to ask you to reflect on it in the Google form I'm going to ask you to go fill out right now, is what do these advantages, right? What do these advantages tell us about this war on paper? And why are these significant advantages the ones that I've outlined here? So go fill out your Google form, and uh, we'll see you in class tomorrow.